We were speaking recently and you told me that you were making music with things that blew into the garden, which is an interesting <laughs> kind of Yeah, thing. it could be seen as just being lazy, I guess. No, it, it kind of stems from, I moved to the kind of countryside rural area about just over a year ago. And I wanted to kind of really embrace being in a rural environment as opposed to an urban environment and just see what that kind of brought to me sound wise. So I think it was just out taking something out into the garage and in the garden and just noticed these objects had blown in, you know, and I thought, I wonder what they'd be like as sort of sample material. It was after a recent purchase of the uh, Coco Qantas over here, which is like a dual sampler. And I thought, oh, this may be kind of interesting to see what I can extract from these objects as kind of as sound material. So that's kind of like the, the genesis of the idea, as it were. I like the the element of chance. We talk, we've talk. we spoke about this a lot on Mods of the Podcast in various mm -hmm. videos about chance in modular yeah, probability yeah. and random. I like the idea of just giving up some control creatively yeah. and just saying, well, if it's not born into the garden, that's not, that's not, I'm not going to pick any other source that's, material. That's exactly right. That The idea behind that was to let that guide my sort of choices as it were if mm -hmm. it didn't come in i didn't have anything to make so these things were kind of acquired over um just a various length of time and then i just collected these and then just see what which ones would be you know work sort of suitability wise so they, they, they vary from kind of natural based objects to tin cans plastic bottles things like that really so what I mean, was that the kind of catalyst for Totemic Topologies, that this series of releases, or was there something else? Was there any other kind of influences to the well, area that you're in? Or? Yeah, I guess, yeah, like I say, moving to this um, rural environment as opposed to being, you know, lived in cities, lived in towns, etc. And obviously you've got a completely different sort of sonic palette to kind of choose from. Um, if you just sort of, even just like the environmental sounds, which I'll kind of get onto later, which are there's an environmental sound in each one of the tracks that's kind of there as a sort of sound bed. But yeah, it basically started from that and I wanted to kind of see what I could extract from the from these different objects. And then I've always been interested in kind of, the kind of the totemic topology sort of title came from, I wanted to kind of make these effectively analog, um, random abstract objects into these new digital forms, you know, so they'll undergo like a transformation from being this sort of static analog item mm. and then they'd be wrapped up in kind of digital processing and they become a new thing you know so so how much of what something blows in be it a branch or a bottle out of a recycling mm. bin or something like that how much of the overall process was in your mind when you pick this thing up and go oh i'll use that once the, the idea is in your mind mm. or is it very kind of experimental along the way yeah, I mean, you, know, you sometimes out and you maybe step on a branch and you go, oh, that'd be a great clap sound yeah. for this drum beat <laughs> yeah, or yeah. whatever. Yeah, yeah. Was there any like immediate influence as to what the end result would be? Uh, I've got to say no, to be honest. It was just, uh, let's see what these can do. Mm. So I, I would then, I mean, we'll, we can talk about this a little bit later when we sort of move into sort of the depth of it. But it was, I just wanted to see, I mean, a lot of it was trial and error. I would take these items and some of them just would, wouldn't make an interesting sound to it. So it was, so they would get put on one side, as it were, like that. Or then I may revisit them, and then with a different apparatus that I'd be using to either take them apart, may find something interesting. But it was, it was more of it. That was the kind of the guiding handrail, as it were, through the project. That that was the source material. I will gather that. I will then bring it into the studio, and then start the process. From there. So one, as this collection's growing of twigs or litter or I think of a bird's nest to look at, mm. at what point were you thinking of what you can hit it with or rub it with or scratch it with or because you know, hit a glass bottle, you ping, ping it or you hit it with a mallet or mm. something soft or something hard, the kind of exciter is as big a part of Absolutely. a physical sound as yeah, you yeah. Know, that done with a drumstick on my hand or mm. with a cloth or a sponge, it's very different. Yeah, when yeah. did that come into play? Yeah, again, as well as collecting the actual physical objects that made the sound, I then had to think about how can I extract these different bits? Because obviously things when I've got branches and there's bark on them, how do I kind of take that off and excite it, as you've mm. you mentioned? So I started to kind of collect things like scalpels, tweezers, pliers, 
sandpaper, mm. um, different things like that that would obviously excite these different surfaces in, in different ways, you know, and hopefully interesting uh, ways. So, so lots of them were quite short, so then um, it was, again, well, I kind of like to use the analogy of almost like a sonic microscope. So you'd, you'd, you'd take a microscope to look at, you know, small objects and get further and further inside them. I was kind of like that analogy between the sound where I was using scalpels and pliers and pulling these apart to see which kind of micro internal sounds were kind of located inside them, you know. Um, yeah, there's a lot, it's like you said, I imagine a lot of the sounds were quite short. Mm. There's nothing ringing or pad-like or certainly nothing like the end result. Mm in the collection of things that we're going to take a look at. Mm. So what was the, did you have those processes in mind of granularizing the snap of a branch and creating beds of sound or loops or was that influenced by the gear as much as the source is influenced by what's blown into the garden or? Yeah, I'd, I'd say pretty much that. Yeah, I, I kind of, um, like I mentioned, I had you know, a fairly recent uh, acquisition of, the, of this um, sample of this Coca Qantas. And um, I liked the ability to be able to stretch these very short sounds into long sounds. So then at each stage, um, the sound picks up yet another layer of artifacts. Mm. So for instance, I've got various um, recording devices that I used to, to record the actual initial sounds. So they'd be it tape or, or digital. Um, so each one of those would impart its own particular flavour and, and sort of sonic characteristics to that. And then they were taken into like the Teenage Engineering OP1 and then sampled and it, they were either sequenced or stretched in there. So that's another layer of, of artefacts as it were. And then they went into the Coca Qantas. So marrying the recording with the source material, was that experimental as well or was there an element of this is a tin can, so I'm going to get that onto a cassette recorder because the high end will be different. Or this is a tin can with all this high end material, so I want to use a nice digital handheld recorder to capture that. Was there a certain, it's almost like matching a microphone to a singer for a band or something. Was there much? Yeah, I like that analogy actually. That That's really good. Yeah, again, probably not as, as rigid as that. I would, um, again, there was loads of happy accidents in this, you know, things where you think, oh, I didn't think the tape had worked really well with this, but it has. Yeah. You know, or the the digital thing has actually picked up more information in there than what I thought there, there could ever be, you know. So uh, there was lots of that back and forth, just to see, again, without sort of being really doggedly accepting the formula, you still have to make the decision with your ears and go, is that an yeah. interesting sound? Yes, no, move on process or go back to the beginning so but yeah there was uh, particularly things with like the bird's nest like the digital microphone I, I kind of just put the the bird's nest directly inside the microphone and was just kind of moving it around so you're getting these kind of in stereo all these tiny little kind of micro sca uh, scratches yeah almost like paper yeah it was rustling like, but yeah but, but like, you kind of had that in, st in stereo yeah yeah it's interesting so over what period of time were the pieces built? There's two volumes of this now, two releases. Is it a case of you have a huge bank of material from the things that have gone into the garden and then these collections, are you finishing a piece, moving on, finding another sound and kind of influencing one sound and moving through to another piece or how are you kind of building this library around? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I would basically Rather than acquire lots and lots of sounds, it would be one set of sounds for that particular piece. See and very through. linear. Yeah. And, and very so so that's the material, that's the process, that's the composition, that's that piece finished, and then move on. Because the reason for that is I didn't want to get bogged down with too much choices because you could literally have hundreds of different you know variations on this. And plus each time it goes, say, from the OP1 into the Coca Qantas. The kind of infinite variables, just just a slight tweak on a on a knob can completely change the the piece itself. So you had to be kind of that's when the kind of artistic judgment bit plays in. Yeah. That you have to kind of go right. That's the line. That's finished. Yeah. And then move on. And I can I like that imposing that kind of self discipline of it being 
that's a recorded piece it is now finished so there's yeah you and know. you're following that creativity through as well it's not building some sort of Foley sample pack for a media company no. you you could have easily said I've got two hours of yeah, raw yeah, recording yeah. And you'd be like, oh, it turns into an admin job. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> of like exactly. Foldering through yeah. it on a computer or yeah, something. Yeah. I mean, definitely, this, this, this process would completely work if you were doing like a fo you know, folio type job, of course. But from a compositional point of view, you just kind of want to go, right, that's the limit. That's why they were only really kind of ever sort of, um, well, I want to kind of say two, but it's probably three elements. So it was the OP1 into the Coca Qantas and then there might be some accompanying rhythm from the plum mutter, which yeah. is kind of like a, a, a drum machine. It's interesting that there's rhythm and air quotes drum machine in there. When you listen to the end result, you don't. it doesn't sound like drum machine. Mm. And I think that's it's a really nice suited piece of kit. It goes very hand in hand. Um, I think we should take a look at some of the sounds, sound sources. So we've got collection of things that have blown in, collection of recorders, um, scalpel tools, extraction or exciting materials. Um, it'd be nice just to talk us through a little bit of what you did. You know, what was some of the first things that you did with some of these sounds? Take a, a branch, for example. Yeah, sure. I mean, this is looks like a dissecting table of some description or other. But yeah, so obviously there's, there's quite a lot of branches and, and different things like this. So I, I might take something like one of these and like get the scalpel and then just remove just the sound of me removing the bark so within all of this there's all these kind of micro tear type sounds and then again something like that that might be taken even further and, and crushed within pliers again this is when I'd probably take something like this um, the zoom and get this further in to be able to get all those tiny little crackles. Things obviously a little bit easier, like these crinkles of plastic bottles are a little bit easier to pick up. I might might be going with something more like like an analog device for that. So there's also the, again a variety of different metal objects. So I think it's a beer bottle lid. I think I'm not quite entirely sure what this is. But these pass through that like with these serrated edges makes sort of quite interesting sounds. And uh, I think this has lost a little bit of its ping sort of sound from this. But this this one on the last release I did, there's almost like a, a like a gong type sound that goes throughout there, and that that's basically this this slowed down a lot, and that's basically created the kind of there's a, like, like like yeah like a metallic strike is is in the sound. But um, again, as I mentioned earlier with the the bird's nest, that was just literally pushed right into there and then moved moved around so you kind of get this stereo kind of scratching sound and all the top sort of tiny little bits of detritus that are inside there there's all sorts of things that was quite a quite a nice find that so where does the the op1 come into play at this stage right yeah looking at this this is the collection it's the sounds it's the things that have blown in the kind of catalyst for each piece mm. the recorders yeah and then the OP one's a little bit of an outlier yeah. on this table potentially. Yeah, yeah so basically, the, the, like I say, the, the sounds have been extracted, you know, been taken from, say, for instance, this bark. They may have been rubbed away from there, put onto any one of these particular devices, be it analog or digital. Then I'll just simply take one of these and play it directly into the microphone. Okay, so there's no direct sound. You're in, no. in another stage of imparting character. Exactly. By playing out of a Walkman speaker or into the mic on the OP1. That's right. I mean, the I really like the mic on the OP1. I mean, uh, again, all depending on what trying to information you're trying to extract. If the signal's too quiet, you may want to have some sort of line, you know, line input with that. But I really like it. And then just that will then normally be sequenced so this, the yeah. sounds then in, in there obviously i might do some uh, some editing of the actual sample itself you know find a find a sweet spot that i like or make it more of a granular type sound 
all just depends on on the sound that we're actually trying to process but then yeah the the sequence is where it kind of adds the musicality for want of a better word from it when we've actually extracted the actual sound so that's actually that can it's like a demented ice cream van yeah it is yeah <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so that's where it's taken from its kind of analog form as it were and this is where it's starting to now get musical yeah so so then this, this would be taken then from there so the, the so those kind of sequenced elements will then be put through the coca quantas for its kind of final destination as it were so from there that's where the kind of the coca quantas is doing the compositional legwork Okay, so not the sounds that we've just been making with the um, various things that have blown into the garden, but with a different sound on the OP1. Let's get it into the Coco Qantas and just see what effect that has. Yeah, sure. As we go through the process kind of bit by bit. So we've got this kind of, I don't know what you'd want to call it, almost like a child piano-y type sound here. Or ice cream van, as you, as you mentioned. <laughs> um, So we can sample some of this. So at the moment the sound is the, um, through the sort of central section on the Coco Quantus, which is the Quantussi, which is like a modulation matrix. There's um, the oscillators, which are like a sine wave oscillator, uh, sorry, a triangle oscillator, just sending the, um, the slice and the direction from back and forwards, and then choosing a different kind of player point as well. Um, you can even sort of change the uh, attack. like a fade in. And then accompanying that, there's a layer from the plum butter. Yeah, so this is kind of, I really like to describe this almost like a soft drum machine. I know Peter describes this as like a, uh, as a drum and drama machine, which is effectively, it has two oscillators and two filters that are providing that's a, a very basic description of it that's providing the sound material so you can get as well as because it's all sorts of very complex um, modulation capabilities you can get very very extreme sounds what you can also get is very very soft and squashed sort of sounds which I really like from it and, uh, and as, well, as well you've got the kind of random elements of the gates that you can have so you can get things that are very that sound very repetitive and then just maybe just change very slightly from just a sort of slight tweak. So we've got two volumes of Totemic Topologies out mm -hmm. already. Um, is this an idea you're going to push further with more releases or? Yeah, there's, there's definitely a third in the pipeline. I'm actually just working on that at the moment. Um, after that, I may just pause it for a while, but it's certainly made me think about the approach mechanism of how these have been composed. So I may kind of explore things like just taking the collection of sound objects a little bit further. I might not just limit myself to things that are airborne as it were coming into the garden because that takes a while and it's got to be windy as well. So yeah. I, I might just kind of, <laughs> the rural location that I'm at, got, I'm in kind of plenty of kind of woodland areas around here and farmland. So they, could be just me actually going for walks and finding material to use but certainly the restrictive process is what I'm interested in and that's really kind of spurred me on to use this in a, in a slightly different way. Yeah we've well got this kind of three-part process of the sound, the collection and imparting tone on how that's recorded yeah. and then the manipulation and the layering mm. uh, through the Coco Quantus and some Plum Butter. I think any one of those pieces you could swap out 
Yeah, yeah. And exactly. it would have a drastically different output. Mm. Source, capture, manipulation, they'd all be very different just for swapping one piece of gear out. Oh, definitely, yeah. I mean, obviously, the, it, you, could, you could change any of the recording methods and obviously the objects themselves are constantly changing. But it's, it's definitely the more the restrictive element that I like about this. So obviously we could, you could find any objects or just go, right, I'm going to use anything I can possibly find. And you may end up spending way too much time in the finding of the objects and then yeah. not enough on the actual processing or the composition part. Oh, you could just be spending too much time in that. I, I like this particular formula that it's kind of, there's not too much of each stage to look at, you know, to get lost in effectively. Again, it's all about restrictions. It's like the equipment here. You can just go spend days and days and days doing something and maybe not get to the end point that you wanted to or you forget what you were actually doing in the first place. It's kind of nice to almost like micromanage this kind of arc of the creative sort of process really. And yeah, it's been really enjoyable doing it.